We're going to switch gears here a little bit. You mentioned that you worked at Aston Martin. So how did you land that role? Absolutely. That's a great question. And it comes also with some great memories on both, on both ends of the spectrum. Welcome to CFD for Industry. I'm Cade Beck, and I'm your host. In today's episode, I'll be interviewing Muhammad Ali Saeed, and we'll discuss why shortcuts with CFD end up wasting your time the benefits of writing a CFD code, and how he got a job on the Aston Martin F1 team. Welcome, Mo. Thank you so much for being here today. And I am just thrilled for our discussion today. Before we get into it, could you briefly introduce yourself? <clears throat> our okay. Thank listeners? you very much for having me. Absolutely. So uh, my name is Mohamed Ali. I'm an aerospace engineer. I'm a PhD holder in um, particle tracking and turbulence flow. Uh, modeling. I uh, I was born and raised in Egypt uh, almost my whole life. I studied aerospace engineering in Cairo University, and I developed so much passion towards fluid dynamics uh, at the end of my uh, studies. Let's say I started to dive into computational fluid dynamics, and I developed so much passion towards that. I I thought that it was very cool at that time, and I still think it's very cool. The only thing that has changed is the level of knowledge. Let's say. And yeah, I don't want to take too much on this, but I've been so passionate about P uh, CFD and I like very much not only playing with equations, but also simulating physical phenomena. The idea that you can simulate the physical phenomena with your computer, and especially with the CPU power that we have today is, is, is very exciting. And I think it's not only about solving problems, but also translating what you learn into useful codes that can help the design process or cut down costs or, let's say, reduce some industrial hazards. It's very exciting for me. And yeah, currently I'm, I'm doing industry. So I shifted last year from academia after my PhD to industry. And yeah, I'm happy to be still working on CFD. I think that uh, it's the Awesome. Nice introduction. It, let's go back to that a little bit. Was it just your interest that made you want to pursue CFD after your undergrad? Or can you just talk about how? what was the evolution from your undergrad to your master's and then PhD? That, that's a good question, actually, because at the, my undergrad, I did my graduation project on a hyperloop. So it was aerodynamic shape optimization used using CFD. That, that was my graduation project and, and the bachelor degree. And it was at, the, at that time, it was quite, let's say, newly evolving the, the idea of Hyperloop as a new transportation means, uh, still on a conceptual uh, front, but was very new at that time. And I, I thought that it was very cool to simulate what would happen in a partially evacuated medium and uh, how to use turbulence models. At that time, it was even a commercial package, uh, ANSYS Fluent, that I used. I, I realized that these closed boxes need to be open and mm -hmm. I wanted to know what's inside. <laughs> But so that, that was just a curiosity that, that provoked my curiosity at that time. And I was still thirsty about CFD. So once I finished my bachelor's degrees, I, I went to France to do my master's degree in fluid mechanics. And that was a, a quite a special program because most of the subjects, so we had one CFD subject, but most of the subjects were also serving uh, CFD from an application point of view. And what inspired me so much to continue my career in CFD was a professor, his name is Siddharth Tardu. I'm incredibly indebted to him for how much curiosity and how much passion he had. So some people feel like it, I can just do my job and it doesn't matter, but it really does matter. If you like what you do, Is some people think it's a cliche or, it, or it's a bit cheesy to say you have to do what you like, and this is the only way to produce good work. But it, it, it really does matter because it's not only about you, but it inspires people who come after. And I, what I absorbed from him, much more than the knowledge in turbulence modeling, because it was maybe from a pure mathematical point of view at that time, was his love and passion about the closure problems and how how turbulence evolves from or breaks down from large scales into small scales and then it dissipates into heat and uh yeah it was this type of energy that moved me and i felt like i really don't know anything about cfd so let's dive more and once i finished my my master's degree i found myself applying for the most different positions actually but i got accepted in a 
in the PhD position in here in Switzerland. And I was very lucky to work with some of the CD pioneers, I would say. Let's say it's an underestimation to, to say that Boyan Niceno, who is, uh, was my former boss, is a pioneer of CD because I went to so many conferences from Greece to Italy to the United States and everyone recognized his name, not only because of his work and his CD codes, but it's, he has intrinsic knowledge of how to translate the physical phenomena into a, a discrete form. It was very inspiring me. Uh, to me and uh, very supportive from him. All of these factors actually contributed to my passion about the uh, CV and what I'm doing now. And that's how my academic career took shape uh, until I finished my PhD last year. That's exciting. That is so exciting. Can we back up a little bit? I want to peel a little bit more into this. So for you, and I think a lot of our listeners are at a similar point where we started this conversation, they've come across CFD, maybe at the undergrad level, it's been mentioned in a fluid mechanics, aerodynamics class, but what did you learn? And you highlighted it, obviously, the the relationship you had with both the professors, your master's and PhD was just so instrumental in, in your learning process. What advice would you give for someone about picking a school, a grad program, and a professor? Sometimes we can't we don't have much flexibility with what's offered, but what things were you looking for? Did you get lucky or did you intentionally look around for specific programs or professors researching certain things? Absolutely. I have two things that, uh, to this point. First thing is, don't care. I, I wouldn't say don't care at all, but don't give that much weight to the university ranking. Mm -hmm. It's really, I come across so many people who would say, this is this university is seventh, this is Ninth. And, and, and to, to be honest, it's not really straight to the point because seventh on, in what you're talking about, a whole university, it has many schools and every school has many departments. Any, every department has many teams. And it, it, it doesn't really reflect a, a, a mentality of someone who wants to win in his field mm -hmm. to talk about the, because it's, to me, it's always like a train that is already working, let's say the TGV, which is the fast train in France. Mm -hmm. The train is already so fast and it's going, it's working. And you hop on. You didn't contribute anything to the train operating. You, you just hopped on while the train was running, let's say, hypothetically speaking. But there, there was another train that, that doesn't function at all. And you kept digging and kept looking with many engineers and technical technicians to find out the problem. And you fixed it and you made it work. What matters more? What, what is more fulfilling? So that's the idea of, I'm not saying that you pick up a university that is, that has no, no, no potential at all. And then you make it great. But I'm, I'm saying about the own, the, you have to have some perception as a student of, what you're going to achieve, what, what what are you going to offer to this university that will give you that much knowledge or this degree or that degree? For me personally, a, a lot of people were asking this, this might get me here or there. And when I went to France, I, I couldn't care less about what Grenoble as a, uh, as a university ranks compared to Cairo University. But I cared more about that if, if it has a good, if it has good reviews or some good feedback in fluid mechanics, this is the field that I picked. And then it, it, it turned out to be a, a great place. I, I, I was inspired for my whole life because of one passionate professor. And after that, when I came also to Switzerland, may, maybe I'm biased by my own experience, but again, I, it, it was self-evident for me that if you join the MIT, just because of the name, but you're not putting, it, it's, it's, it's like you both have to go together. Maybe you would, it would be great, right, if you join Oxford or any top 10 university and then you're putting so much effort and work, then you get a very good package. But if you're willing to, to join something just to have the name, it's not really the, the right mentality. And the second thing is you have to ask. I would say that uh, it's been a, a very big thing for me. Asking questions never hurt. And sometimes you get something really that you, it was never on your mind just by knocking the door and asking someone, and this, this works really just great in, in academia, at least from my, uh, from my experience. Yeah, I really love that, Mo, that, yeah, there's this concept of directness and it's so much easier to apply 
what you've learned when you've learned it in a similar situation is where you want to use it. And so if a professor is working on a problem that interests you, then go work with that professor or try to, and then it'll be so much easier to take that to industry or to your own academic, wherever people feel like they should go instead of looking at it from a Yeah. Just excellent comments on the ranking and just asking too. That's definitely been evident in my life as well. So thank you for explaining that. It's really good. A little bit more about school and and the progress. What was your study process like? I hear lots of different methods that work well for people, but what I find is that people figure out what works well for them to study. And so what worked well for you, Mo, your study process and how you approached problems in your research? That, that's a really great question because when I studied in Egypt, uh, what I really liked and I disliked at the same time mm. is that things were too manual. So uh, we didn't have so much application, let's say, at, at, at the university for, for two obvious reasons. One is that it's a very theoretical-based study uh, school, uh, Faculty of Engineer, Engineering at Cairo University. And second is that we, don't, we didn't have so much facilities. And the, the, the funds are in, 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 let's say, in the Middle East or in a third world country is by, uh, by a considerable magnitude far less than what, what any university in, in Europe or most of the universities in, in Europe and, and, or in the States uh, are provided. And we didn't have that. So if you go to a lab, the lab is not well, well equipped, then you have some, let's say, some bugs here and there, some licenses that are not both. And then you have to figure out your own way through this jungle. But so this is the part that I dislike, but it pushed us or pushed the professors who taught us to give us the more, let's say, the, the, the mathematical approach. We were literally solving uh, 12 by 12 matrices by, by our own hands to calculate, some, let's say, in structures, some stiffness matrix to uh, to calculate the internal stress in structure or CFD to inverse the matrix that's really big, considerably big in the examination test time. So it gave so some kind of resilience to what would come after, but at the same time, it was very profound or it was important to instill the, the profound knowledge for what is CFD. Before we, we dive into numerics, we have to understand why did we have to go to numerics? So the study process was always going like this. So it's building blocks from something that's non-existing to why would we have to, to create something that's called CFD? And passing through the master's and PhD, I realized that many things that can work for me or for someone, but what I realized for sure that doesn't work for me is to take shortcuts. And especially for CFD, if you want to jump a step to generate a solution quickly, you, yes, you will find the solution. You will get something, especially if you're using Star CCM Plus or any commercial package like Ansys Road. So <laughs> the idea of garbage in, garbage out is not sometimes a bit underestimated because people are excited about the results. But and, and, and I've seen that some people approach actually in, in my LinkedIn po- uh, uh, inbox and someone sends a pressure contour that just make, makes no sense. And they want to, because this wishful thinking, they want to, they wish that it's a, it's the right result, but they skip some stuff in between, like boundary conditions, scrutinization, or uh, how do you model, how do you model this physical phenomena? Do you have the right, do you, do you have the right problem setup and boundary conditions? But if, yeah, uh, I, I guess that's quite intuitive for everyone, but lots of people forget about this. And, and I was guilty of these shortcuts at the beginning. But I realized that it's you have to go through step by step, and then you can ramp up by exponential scale. In the end, once it's working, you can complicate the problem as much as you want. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent insight there. I too, I smiled because I too am guilty of the shortcut early on. And <laughs> the sooner you learn for yourself not to make shortcuts, the easier things go. And sometimes you just have to learn it, right? I think we're all guilty of that because this does bring up another point too that, and I think it's important to put up guardrails somewhere. You can't learn everything. Nobody has time to learn everything and nor should you in a PhD. But once you've picked a topic, dive in and go in and don't take shortcuts around that topic. But yeah, excellent insight there. Do you have a piece of feedback 
that you received from one of your advisors that was just really critical or transformational for you? You talked about their enthusiasm and the excitement and how that transferred to you. But was there ever a time where they gave you some pretty stiff or tough feedback? Hey, Mo, you're really needing to do this differently. Or did you ever get any transformative feedback like that? Yes, actually, yes, actually, uh, that's a good one because I, I was trying to subconsciously dismiss this kind of feedback because it was very mild before my PhD. And then there was one day that I asked for a meeting from my my PhD supervisor. Uh, it was really a nice guy. And he said, because uh, he, he had to be direct at some point. And he said, we would have this meeting after you've done this. So... What is this is that he realized that I'm going through some small details and sometimes I lose track of the bigger picture uh, a bit, uh, trying to scrutinize very small margin of error. That's not very relevant to the problem. So if let's say if you're validating an experimental facility, you're so keen into this because what you will validate through this through, through this experimental test will create the, the error margin. So the error, these error parts that we see on any experimental data to validate from, this is what this is your output. So you have to be very careful about the error. But when you're doing CFD, and especially for an, a bit of an industrial problem or a, let's say a nuclear power plant, and you're trying to look through the trends, you're not interested in 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 the magnitude as you're interested in the trend. If if the velocity profile is doing like this or it has a, a bottom and top or something, it's just looking through the trend. And I was trying to scrutinize why my extreme values, so let's say the, the values from between walls or in the proximity of the wall, why the wall function is behaving this way. And I neglect the bulk region that, so I, I, I've got this comment, let's say several times in the past, and the moment that was quite pivotal for me that I realized, no, this is really something that I, I it's a characteristic for me. I have to change it because it must be that I can't be right on all of these people from different countries are wrong. So this is where I work in, yeah, in, in my previous job and it's a sensitive industry. And then someone says, look, we know that this model is not the best. And we know that the more you refine the mesh, the, the, the more accurate results you will have. We know this and we know that. And they give me a kind of a polite lecture uh, uh, to, to get out of my uh, uh, accuracy OCD. <laughs> so that that feedback was very helpful because now my approach is more on a on a on a, on a global level. I, I try to I try to let go, and it's it's not very easy if you really like something or interested about something. It's not very easy to let go, but it, it rewards you in a different angle also because you get closer to the solution faster. Yeah, and this is this topic is what has fascinated me about CFD, and it the title I've given presentations with this title before, and it's the title of the book I'm working on. How close is close enough? And yes. the answer to that question, because you can't ignore the details. There are some details that are absolutely critical, and those details vary depending on the objective of the study, the simulation. And it's really glad you shared that insight. And that's something that it's really critical to do. And I, I especially love the comment that you said, the kind of the evidence of if everyone else gets it and I'm not getting it, then there must be something. And that makes me chuckle because I'm reading a book right now. It's called Principles by Ray Dalio. It's like a 16-hour book, anyway, the audio version. And one of the things he talks about is when, are you writing it down? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. That's one thing I love about you, Mo. Um, one of the things he talks about is, and again, this isn't a finance podcast, but it was really cool. He's a finance guy and he just systematized his decision-making. When he would make a decision, he would document. And then he's, he just, one of his things is just being radically open-minded to everybody's opinion and insights and data. And I think as engineers, we say that we are very data driven, but when it comes to being right, our emotions can get in the way of seeing ourselves objectively. Okay. And I know I fall guilty of that way more often than I'm sure I'd like to admit, but really appreciate that experience. Well, let's transition to a little bit more technical stuff. What is a brief introduction of wall modeled LES for beginners? So the idea is actually that you have a boundary layer and this boundary layer, if I don't know about the percentage exactly, but the majority of the flows that are encountered in nature or in any application are turbulent flows. 
Those are turbulent flows, which means that you have to, to, to give some more due attention to what is called the boundary layer, which is the, the, the region close to the wall. Let's just, let's just throw it this way. And if you want to pay enough uh, attention to this region, it has to be, so either that you model it or resolve it. And the word resolve it is, is quite puzzling in itself because I'm, you're not really sure if you can ever resolve it because it, it's Reynolds number dependent. And when I say Reynolds number dependent, it's uh, for, for someone who might not know, it's, it's basically velocity. If you're dealing with scales of motion and the bigger you have of these scales in the bulk region, that's not very, that's not, that's not the, the significant part. But the smaller you have of scales close to the wall, that's what really matters. And of course, the scatter between the big scales and large scales. But I'm, I'm saying that it's less significant than the bulk region. And the bulk is the, the upstream or the, let's say the bulk flow is less challenging because you, you would have at some point a mesh that resolves this area. You have, you have uh, for example, in a 2D, the, the minimum number of cells to resolve an eddy is to have four cells. That's the, the minimum number of cells. It's just so you have the directional vectors to represent the rotational motion. But the problem is that when you go to the wall, these eddies are getting smaller and smaller because the energy has to be conserved somewhere. And that's the problem. The energy has to be conserved. And in order for the energy to be conserved, it has to dissipate or to go somewhere because eddies are breaking down, breaking, and getting closer, close to the wall, they are infinitesimally small. And then there, there is no elsewhere to go, so they dissipate into heat. They disappear, but then they, in, in, the, this transformation creates heat at the wall through the wall shear stress. The problem is that, let's pick, for example, we, we said wall model LES. So before wall model, if we say LES, from what the name implies, it's called large eddy simulations. And large eddy simulations, it's large eddy simulations. So it's meant, this method is meant to resolve large eddies. And it's really good at solving large eddies. But the problem is near from the wall, there is no large eddies. There are only tiny, small infinitesimal scales. And what do we do in pure LES, or what they call world resolved LES or resolved LES, all of these names are, is that we make a non-uniform bit that we keep we keep stacking or we keep stretching cells in the perpendicular direction to the wall and going or moving closer to the wall in the direction of the wall, you, how do you say, you squish the cells a, a bit to, in order to resolve these, these small scales before it, it dissipates into heat. The problem is that it doesn't stop there. If you have a Reynolds number of, let's say, 100 or 150 shear Reynolds number in a pipe flow, and this Reynolds number grows to 600, four times higher. What happens is that the boundary layer doesn't stay as it is. It, it goes thinner. So it gets thinner and thinner the more you increase the speed. And that inherently creates smaller and smaller scales that you need to resolve. So it goes exponentially that you have to refine the mesh in the wall direction or in the trick proximity of the wall to the extent, and of course it goes to the power of, of, of Reynolds number, that it becomes prohibitively expensive. And of course, the same goes because large eddy simulation, as the definition of Pope the, in, in the book Turbulent Flows, is that you need to resolve up, not up to, but starting from 80% of the turbulent kinetic energy. If you resolve in the peak and the location of turbulent kinetic energy, 80% plus, then that is considered as large eddy simulation or well resolved LES. You need to resolve approximately all the turbulent kinetic energy to call yourself that you're resolving DNS. That's why DNS is excluded from the beginning for the industrial applications. Then going to LES, it's also excluded because high Reynolds numbers and swirling flows. And uh, uh, so, so you have it's, it's quite complex to to afford that with with the current conventional methods of CFD. And that's why you you have this idea of modeling the wall. So you're not really focused on having void plus of 0.5 or 1, which is quite which is quite extreme in most applications, especially, let's say, in Formula 1 or in aerospace industry. And then you focus on having some wall function. And what this wall function does is it approximates the wall area by a correlation that says, if I'm at that location from the wall, I would have this 
this value for the velocity. I would have this value for the frictional velocity, and therefore I would have uh, a value for the whole shear stress. But without actually solving the velocity dislocation, so there is so the first point that you put is already away from the wall, away enough from the wall that you have a reasonable mesh, or let's say a rams like mesh, it's not really a rams like mesh. But that's the idea to, let's say, to bridge the gap between RANS and LDS without losing so much accuracy. And you are still time dependent. So you still have a transient solution that uh, is progressing through. I think maybe just to help clarify, and you touched on it a little more at the end. So what are the main differences between what we would call well-modeled LES and RANS? Is it just because there's wall functions and those other things. So what does the wall model LES have that maybe our standard wall function in RANS don't have? Obviously, you noted the transient aspect well, of it. Yes, that's a good question. So there are actually, there are several types of wall model LES. There are types that mimic some kind of a hybrid trans LES approach that, that you're implicitly or explicitly shifting between LES model which is, let's say, Smogorinsky or the Veil model, uh, or some, let's say, standard baseline LES model, and then you're explicitly shifting to solve transport equations of RANS, let's say, K epsilon, K omega, near from the wall. So you say from Y plus 1 to Y plus 50, I'm doing this, or explicitly activating RANS, and then I'm switching to Smogorinsky uh, or Smogorinsky dynamic model at the edge of the logarithmic layer of the boundary layer. So you're letting... All the uh, um, leaving all the heavy lifting for rents to be taken care of at the walled region, and then I'm resolving that the scales in a transient fashion. And the transient fashion here goes between codes because even the rents in these hybrid models. So what what happens in, in hybrid models? You're not really distinguishing between time dependent and not time dependent. If you have this type of scheme that you're resolving explicitly. LES, and then you go to the home, then you switch to K epsilon or K omega, you're resolving both in time. But the way that you're averaging the domain is different. So you say you're using time average or ensemble averaging. That's what matters in this case. But you have also different types of one model LES because you could also have an algebraic model that, let's say, an algebraic function that approximates what the velocity of the flow behavior close to the wall would be according to some linear function like the power power low or the low of the wall. And then once you transition from that area, you, you switch to something that resolves the, the velocity at the cell centers using one of the one of the Pusinisk approximation models that, that you have a correlation between what is the mean velocity gradient and the random stresses that are not resolved. And this linkage goes through the eddy viscosity or the artificial turbulent viscosity. And this one is what links between either the algebraic model or the hybrid trans LES. So you use it as a blending between mm -hmm. those two regions. Instead of having one eddy viscosity only, but having to pay a little bit more, you have more accurate representation of the wall. But in some applications, you don't really care so much what happens at the wall as much as you care about the global picture of how more or less how much drag we have how much lift we have over this surface or over this wing yeah so, that was going to uh, be my next question is what's the application when would someone because piggybacking on our earlier conversation of sometimes the details don't matter so can you just provide some context of when this would be really important and where people are using this and they're seeing the value added from this extra effort because there's always trade-offs right so when is it making sense for people to deploy this Absolutely. Let's say if you have an academic or fundamental research problem that you really need to develop a new turbulence model, for example. I'm developing a new turbulence model that has a capability of solving uh, turbulent heat flux in a specific way, let's say. And if, if you're adding something to, let's say, a source term to one of these Stokes equations, or one, one, more, one more transport property or one more transport equation to K and Epsilon, then this thing is not validated yet. So you care about every single detail. So I would say, yeah, he, th those are the. This is the area where small margins of error really matter, mm -hmm. because it's something that you're uncertain of. But if you go to something that's highly industrial and the application is, uh, let's say, a Formula One car, let's say, if you 
it, it's a trade-off. You have to know the, that this surface maybe is producing something or not producing something, and this comes as an accu accumulation of experience. But from people who gather this information, they know, for example, that the front wing is essential. And it's not only because it's intuitive that it's a front wing, but the thing is that any, let's say any king in the velocity field, any art of numerics or some numerical diffusion that happens will definitely affect the rear, the wheels, the front wheels. And the front wheels will have this kick that will be either augmented or suppressed and therefore affecting also the rear wheels. And all of these, what, what they call the, um, what they call the front wheel wake and rear wheel wake. And these wakes are super important, for example, in the Formula One world, because it's, it's a, it's a significant thing that, that you're trying to see how much potential or how much exertion you're extracting out of the car in terms of drag reduction or increasing the downforce. You're trying to increase the downforce as much as you want, uh, as much as you can, but at the same time, increasing the downforce has a, a directional component that increases the drag as well. So you got to focus it at this point on what, what matters to me the most. For, for example, we uh, when I worked for Aston Martin, uh, we used to focus on some surfaces and giving it, giving these surfaces more layers because you're still not resolving the boundary layer, but let's say you add 11 layers of inflation on this surface, but you go for other, on other surfaces and you give only five inflation layers because there is no right or wrong, but there is more important and less important. Hmm. And there is no way that you could have everything solved in a super accurate way. But as I said, you say, if I have 10 layers here, I, I, I might extract one point of downforce or one point of load. But this one point is less biased than the other surface that has five, five uh, inflation layers instead of 10 only. It, it's, yeah, it comes with experience. But yeah, as I said, it, it depends on what matters more. Yeah, great explanation. For someone who wants to read more about this and get into it, do you have any good references for them? On, 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 sorry. For someone who wants to, sorry, get into like the wall modeled LES, where would someone start if they were wanting to learn more about that? I think as a Kickstarter, the manual from uh, Mentor, Dr. Florian mm. Mentor from ANSYS, I guess it's a good point to start because it has also lots of references. It also gives you a, a brief introduction of what the concept is and gives you also what uh, some figures that tells you what to expect if yeah. you apply them. Because also when I was implementing some of these in Musco, I wanted to see before I start implementing and debugging and so on, what would I gain if I implement this model? and you're also trying at some point to have a trade-off of how much effort you, you put into the model and how much you could extract out of it. So. Yeah. Yeah. The golden trade-off, right? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So how did you get involved in particle-laden flows? That, that was actually during my PhD. So when I applied to my PhD program, I knew that it would involve it, it would it would contain some multi-phase flow simulations and multi-phase flow modeling, but I didn't know specifically that it would have particle level flow as a main topic. And I, I was excited anyways because it looks more it, it sounds more uh, more cool and definitely it is more uh, complicated because you're solving as many it depends on what type and what model, what method you use to to resolve the, the multi-phase flow simulation. But what happens is you need two phases to coexist next to each other. And there is an interface. Let's say if you have a separated flow, then it's, I, I, I'm, I'm diving into the details without, without ans answering the, the question you asked me. But I got into particle level flows because it was the, the main topic of my PhD. And I was actually quite in interested because it was, let's say, it was defined, but there was some room for, for flexibility or for mod modification on the original topic. And what drives me to keep going in, in, in this, and I was very passionate, is that you find particulate flows almost everywhere, even if you don't notice. We are growing up, if you go to the beach, you see already always the waves are, are crashing on, onto the sand. And you see all of the, let's say, soiling effects everywhere. You see all the erosion effects everywhere, whether you grow up with close to the sea or close to a river. So if you look at most of the things that we grow up with or in, in, in real life, for example, it, most of 
not only applications, but most of the natural phenomena that happen that happens around us on a daily basis is particle induced or partic- a particulate flow essentially from raindrops. And I actually learned a lot about this topic during my PhD because when the rain forms, it doesn't ha- happen really haphazardly. It's, it's a complicated phenomenon because the fact that raindrops join together to form a bigger raindrop and it's heavy enough to draw uh, to drop uh, after the con- as a as part of the condensation process, this doesn't happen in a on a uniform or a universal scale. It happens with something that's that's called preferential concentration of ter- or turbophoresis. And the first part of the word turbophoresis is coming from turbulence or turbulence induced force. And this uh, this is just one of one small example that turbulence induces some specific patterns of particles or water drop particles that are really small and tracer type or very infinitesimal drops, but they will never fall. And because of this preferential concentration, they start to form into some shapes and then they are, so let's say they are dense in some areas and sparse in some other areas. And then they join together, they form bigger drops, and then these bigger drops are not able to follow up with the air time scale anymore. So that's the carrier fluid. It doesn't really, it, it cannot catch up with the instant changes in the air anymore. So it deviates, it kind of slips. And that's what happens which makes the rain, raindrops fall. One of just one of the applications, or if, yeah. you, if you if you have any industrial factory that, that could have some hazards or with or without hazards, you need to assess what or what is the area of, of what's the affected area. If there is any output or fumes or some some type of particulate matter that comes out of it, and you need to scale or to measure this to see the, the surrounding area. So all of these applications that are really interesting for me and when i when i started i realized that with a very simple code actually you can dive into most of these applications and compute them to a level of accuracy so it's uh, awesome awesome we've touched on this a bit we've talked quite a bit about turbulence but was there anything specifically that you did looking back now that you really felt helped you get a handle on not only the neighbor stokes equations in general but just wrapping your head around it and getting the context of, okay, because I feel like for some people, and let me give an example, when you're first doing something, it's very difficult. Like right now, my son is learning how to ride his bike without training wheels. And so he's so focused on just staying balanced and pedaling that it's difficult to look up and see ahead where he's going. And sometimes with learning, it's like that. There's research that shows that, right? We're so busy on getting the mechanics of it that we don't see the landscape. And can you think of a time or an experience that helped you shift from cranking through things that you could see the perspective of, okay, this is what we're actually trying to do. And then what helped you get to that point? That's a great question. There is There are actually several moments that I felt like this, and it could be, if I understood your question correctly, it could be because you sometimes you have a uh, you, you put a boundary for yourself that kind of obstructs you to reach the end goal, and you feel that it's helping you. You feel like it's going mm-hmm. within the same lines. For example, your son was focused on staying in balance, which is the objective that you want to be balanced. But at the same time, it's intuitive because the more you focus on it, the more you you, you panic, the more you feel anxious, and then yeah. and then you. And one of these, for me, at least at the beginning of my career, was that I didn't have a very good uh, experience. Obviously, I'm an aerospace engineer. I I don't have a a degree in in, in software engineering or or programming. And this kind of came as a side, always was a side project that I'm learning this beside this, just to serve the plate, but not the main dish. And actually, what's part, uh, yeah, the thing that was like the um, training wheels, was for me that Fortran, Fortran, Fortran is a ghost. And it's a very old language and it's very specific. It has to, it, it has to be respected in a way it's because it's not so user friendly in a sense, you know, it's, it's getting better. But at that time, I realized that if you really focus that this tool is missing and this tool is missing, you're not going to progress much because you need them also. But at the same time, you have to let go a bit that you say, 
for example, I might use this. So the, the way that it happened with me that I started even with a commercial package, and then you grow love and passion to the topic through this, then you realize that you're gaining confidence. I'm now, I, I produced results already. Let's understand those results. And then from those results, let's scrutinize the input because this is the output. And then you realize, no, it's, it should be really the other way around that we scrutinize the input before the output. And then you realize that the input is not fully understood. So it takes you, it, it takes one, some steps to first grow some, uh, grow passion, build confidence, and then grow experience and knowledge. And then you, you feel that you have the momentum already to shift from this code. And then I'm going to build my own code or I take a code that I can see what's inside and build on top of it. And then at some point in a, in a happy hour or something, then you say, okay, I'm going to develop this module or I'm going to build something that solves 1D, uh, 1D uh, heat contributed by myself in Python or something. But the way that I, I, I felt that it was always working for me to get myself out of this is to it hands on mm -hmm. and I'm, I visited the United States only once in my life. And that was the eye opener for me. Not about the culture, but, but mo mostly about what I learned in this. It was like a boot camp. Mm -hmm. And I was introduced, introduced to many programming languages in a very short time. And then I realized that things are not really that complicated. It's just building blocks. And if, for example, a language like Python, it's it's really easy to learn Python, but people don't. People, if you don't know how to code Python, then you're just scared of the word itself, or you feel like people who talk about Python are really good at this, and I have no idea about. But the moment that you step a foot, then you realize that it's just building blocks. You're literally writing like writing English compared to, to like C plus plus or something. But even uh, with with the inheritance and all the all the all the benefits that come with that come with a language like C++. It's just great to build blocks. But in order to build this passion or momentum that I want to stay consistent on this until I learn it best and ma I master it, then you have to have some, some form of, of confidence or passion. And that's what I meant is just throw yourself into it. If that was the, the right answer. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's just interesting to, to hear. I feel like there's a turning point for everyone of where you see, you quit focusing on the trees and you're able to see the forest and you're like, okay, this is where we're headed. And it, it really does turn out to be a defining moment. I feel like from my observation for many people of that confidence of, okay, I feel so much more confident, not just with this problem in this domain, but on how to approach future problems. Cause that's why we like what we do as engineers, that there's a new problem and we get to solve and so I think this transitions well to, you talk about how you developed your CFD modeling framework. So maybe if you could just walk through your framework for how you approach problems. Sure. Yes. I, I, as I said, when I used CFD for the first time, it was ANSYS and ANSYS still used. And I, I guess it will stay for some time, especially for people who are working in industry, because you don't want to put so much investment into teaching people how to be experts in developing a CFD code. But uh, as I said, it's, it ignited this passion. And then I started to look into some smaller details. Uh, and and uh, I had a great project on aerodynamics where we would ask or, or compel to continue to, or to finish the subject or to have the, the examination is to develop a MATLAB code, which produces only, let's say, some very normal analysis on a specific type of an airfoil. And this was to, that you need to build a mesh around this geometry. You need to import the geometry or draw it inside the MATLAB code. Then you make a boundary fitted grid or O grid or any type of grid around that airfoil. And then calculate some forces, drag, drag and lift, and then their coefficients at the end of the code. That's a very simple problem, and especially if you deal with 2D inviscid flow. So you, you don't have to care about turbulence at all, and you don't have to care about the, the three-dimensional effects as well. But what it did to me is that I realized that, so you, you, you need to love it. You need to have the, the, the passion of writing a code. And because writing a code is, is not only solving the problem. If it was that, it, it would have been boring for, for, uh, for many years for, mm -hmm. for many people, but it's an interaction method with the computer. It's talking because that's always what I tell my wife. You have no idea how happy I am. If it's, everything is peaceful, I'm at a late hour of night. 
I'm sitting in front of the computer. I'm just communicating this bash script or this automation script. I'm telling the computer, look, while I'm, I'm asleep, just submit this job after you finish and post process the result in this kind of discussion with. <laughs> and it, it started with a MATLAB code for me. It was very short, calculating visit flow on 2D. And then it developed into uh, a Fortran code that I, uh, I was writing with my former boss on, uh, during my PhD. So I was developing a framework for a particulate flow. So then the main Navistock solver was there. And what I did is that I implement a module that says, here is the domain. We're going to infuse some particles on top of this domain. And we're going to make these particles um, move or be affected by the carrier flow field or the primary flow field. And without diving into so many technical details, it's, it's very interesting to, to put something because you build a relationship with it. You feel that every day you wake up and then it's a small purpose with the computer. Then you feel like you're developing the computer because it's, it's a capability that before you develop the code, it was never there. And especially if it's, and, and that's something actually that is quite underestimated for, for TV analysts. Uh, some people feel that in the moment that I'm mastering a specific tool, there is no need really for me to write my own code. And I think that it's you're, you're missing out on a lot because the moment you write, even if you know the constitutive equations, it's not really enough because you have another dimension once you write the thing yourself. Because you will have so many crashes and so many bugs. And through these errors, you will learn that, ah, that's a numerical trick. And that's the first time I realized this during my PhD. Because what's the, 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 the lame, let's say, <laughs> numerical tricks of MATLAB that you, you're dividing by zero or you have an infinite matrix or something like this, then you have a syntax or you have a, a, a runtime error. But what if you go a bit low level or less user-friendly than MATLAB, you realize that there are some stuff that you need to define for the computer if, in order to inverse a matrix or something. Yeah. It's, you go a bit deeper and then you build this relationship that here I have this outlier cell that's producing some problems. Let's suppress it a bit. So it's not only about CFD, but it's about, as you said, engineering approach into how to solve problems. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely, you just triggered my memory of the first time I wrote like a script to to automate some stuff. And it was so frustrating because I I didn't, I'm a civil engineer by training. And so we didn't get a lot of programming and the stuff we did get at that time, I was probably trying to take too many shortcuts anyway, but I really just sat down and said, I need to figure this out. And it was so rewarding at the end to go through it and to realize, okay, this is why, and this is what it's doing. And I just processed millions of points of data (laughs) that I never have to touch again. And it, it it is, it's a really nice feeling of accomplishment to have those milestones like that. So excellent insights on the technical stuff. We're going to switch gears here a little bit. You mentioned that you worked at Aston Martin. So how did you land that role? That just seems like a dream job for an aerospace or an external flows aerodynamics person. Can you tell us two things? One, how did you approach the job search? And then two, what did you learn at Aston Martin? Absolutely. That's a great question. And it comes also with some great memories on both, <laughs> on both ends of the spectrum. But it's a, it was a fantastic opportunity, actually. So once I finished my PhD, I was looking normally like everyone for some jobs here and there. And I was quite actually focused on finding something in Switzerland because I wanted to have something here for my wife to settle also because she's Swiss. And... Uh, but I, I was not confined really. I was, I, I said that if I find something, because Switzerland is more focused on, let's say, economics and business and uh, uh, less so on uh, on engineering uh, uh, projects, especially mechanical engineering. So I, I broadened the spectrum a bit and I thought maybe I look in England and then, and one of the jobs that I came across before even Formula One actually was Boeing. Mm-hmm. And uh, I also had some, some stuff at Lucid Motors. And it, it, once I had the, let's say, technical interviews there, it raised the bar a bit because you feel like, oh, I'm getting interviews in these places. So I said, let's not neglect any job position. I will apply in my interest, no matter what. So it, yeah. it, it, it doesn't Absolutely. matter. Absolutely. Yeah. And then it gave me some 
some hope because there are some sensitive industries that let's say you need some clearance or you need some specific nationality. And when I left in France, let's say Airbus was quite disappointing to me in that aspect. But I said, Formula One, I'm gonna apply anyways. But up to that moment, I was not I was not a fan of Formula One, to be honest, up to that moment at all. And I never really followed when I was young and with my father as this is mainstream story. But I loved Aston Martin as a brand. Since I was young, I used to go with my friend to the outlets of Aston Martin in Cairo, the road car, Aston Martin road car. And I look from the glass shield and I, I, I tell my friend, when I can uh, acquire one of these, it's just amazing. It's, it's just so sleek. And it, 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 it attracts you, the, the, the car design and everything. And of course, Formula One is the pinnacle of this, of the, of the aerodynamic technology, because you have to, you're competing and everything. But I, the, let's say the motive for me or what made me push the button to apply for the position was the name more than Formula One itself. And then I realized if I get the chance, then it's even better. Because it also, I, I felt that apart from anything, it's it's a very big name and definitely I would learn something new, but yeah. it's so new from where I've been in because everyone said it's going to be so stressful. But I said, mm-hmm. come on, if I get a chance, let me be stressed for a couple of years. Yeah. And uh, I, I was quite lucky because it was quite, how do you say, dire competition. It's a competition on a very high level because everyone wants to get in. There are only 10 teams on the planet and everyone wants to get in even once a lifetime. Everyone who cares about Formula One wants to get in. And I was a, I was the poor guy who doesn't care so much about Formula One, but can't say it <laughs> out loud because I would be excluded from the very beginning. So I tried to avoid any question that has to do with the law for Formula One or <laughs> or something like this. And I focused on the technicalities. Yeah. And yeah, I, thought I, was, I was lucky, with, but I would say more that I should be grateful because it's not only luck that, that, that gets you to get through this, this type of interviews. I guess there were four or five and three of them were really like grinding interviews. But once I, once I was there, I realized that it, it, life is really so relative. You feel that you are not, you are not, not that everyone feels like that, but sometimes we think that it's so specific and we're gaining so much knowledge in some topic that you feel that this is this topic is the center of the universe, hybrid rent, LES or particle level flows. And I just finished my PhD when I joined there. And it was such a humbling experience mm-hmm. because you realize that you don't know almost anything about aerodynamics compared to these guys. It, they're doing it on a crazy level. It's just crazy to witness. Uh, and especially the, immer- the uh, how do you say, emerging teams or maybe uh, very aspiring teams that uh, Aston Martin up to last year was not really competing even on fourth. Um, and, and, and this year it made a huge jump. So to, to have this, this level of competition, you have to pay attention to every, every little detail and everything has to be very consistent and no even technical logistic issue can happen uh, with a cluster during the weekend. So it's, everyone is working as a beehive, in a, as in a beehive to, to make the thing happen. It was, it was just a, an unprecedented experience for me. But shortly after I joined, I realized that for family reasons, I, I have to step back because it was not going in, uh, in line with my family. Uh, so let's say uh, my family situation was quite destabilized by moving to England at that time. And from for everyone who, who knows places in, in England, uh, that the Aston Martin team is situated in Silverstone. And this area is not, is not the most likely in England. So it was quite tough for my family. And also on top of being tough for my family, there, there, there was a big stress to come back home and then you realize that there is some discrepancy between your energy level and your partner's levels. And it's it's so easy to spend 12 hours per day working uh, or 13 hours sometimes for anyone on Formula and Formula, Formula One, they know uh, very much what this means. Uh, sometimes you're lucky if, if you finish from seven to seven, you finish everything that, uh, that you needed to do. Um, but yeah, there, there, there was all, uh, um, good stories and challenging stories but uh, at the end of the day looking forward when i realized that this experience is coming to an end and i'm not going to stay there for 15 years i was quite sad and really challenged but looking backward now i feel like this was one of the best experiences 
And e even knowing that I stay, stayed five, six months, I would always go back and do this experience for what it taught me. Um, yeah. 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 That's great. And I think, and we've talked about this, I think that's about the time I met you as you were transitioning. The hard decisions like that come up, right? And just being able to know and enjoy what you learned, but then be able to do what's best for you and your family and to feel that way. So I know I've definitely had those experiences as well. So thanks for sharing that. Just before we wrap up, what, what's been your experience? The title of this podcast is CFD for Industry. And one of the things that I talk about often and try to highlight is it takes more than just technical skills. To succeed in industry, the conditions are just like calculus. It's necessary, but not sufficient. And so what have you done or what do you feel like you've learned about acquiring some other non-technical skills to succeed and what's helped you do that? Absolutely. Team spirit. I would say always team spirit a million times because you could have you could have someone who's really competent in CD or in, in any field and they're really helping the company generate lots of profit, but no one around them is comfortable. And for mm. me, I would never want that type of an employee. I hope that I'm never that type of an employee, but I feel that I succeeded to 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 some extent to to be the to be a nice team player and not someone that that has a hard time to separate between their emotions and their work because that's that that soft skill side of it is is very important to to make sure that you don't really you don't become troublesome. You don't have you don't have some ego involved in your business. You don't as much as you can you try to separate between the the emotions and the, the work that you're doing. And it's if if you some people say that you can't really treat work like family because it's not family. And I really understand that. But just treat it as a sports team. And if you want this team to win, which goes back to you inherently. It will just go back to you if you do something that affects negatively the team, which is the company you work with. It will affect your work directly, whether if it's tomorrow or next year. So it's in your own interest to to make things work properly and accurately. So it can go back to you again if if there's no other motivation. Uh, but I would say that yeah, is we always had this this discussion with my. With my previous boss before I left as the Martins, they wanted to hire someone, but the, the, so replacements are always there. Everyone is replaceable. Some people think that it's it's quite difficult, but actually, lots of people are. The idea is just you can't replace someone with the exact same replica because everyone has their fingerprint. But what is really challenging is to have someone who is. I just call it like this, but maybe it's a it's a very generic word. We call it like a, a the nice guy, but also have a, the, the 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 right skills, and maybe it's just in in my sphere of uh, of, 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 of um, academia, or it was it was just my sphere that always what I witnessed. You have someone who's highly uh, qualified for something, but they are so into it that they don't have so much social skills, or they don't really know how to interact sometimes. Some word can come out like this and then causes a problem or someone can maybe, because they are very passionate about a specific topic. So they bring into the work environment something that has nothing to do with work, but it makes the water turbid, if you if that's a thing. If mm -hmm. it makes the atmosphere very turbulent. And that that's not the optimum case. Um, what you should care about is that you're not interacting only with the computer, as you wrote in a post lately that I really liked. But you, these are people with emotions, and everyone is to be respected just like you are. So it's it's really a great point to to bring across. To you, yeah. 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 Thank you so much for our discussion today, Mo. Okay. Really appreciate your willingness to to share with us your journey and your insights, and I'm excited to to stay updated as you keep progressing. So thank you again, and we'll see ya. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Kate. Thank you for listening. Really, thank you. Let me know why you liked this episode in the comments below and tell me if you've got any ideas for future topics or people you'd like me to interview.